We've all likely had some sort of run-in with carnivorous plants in our plant parenthood journeys. Maybe it's been bringing one of those little Venus fly traps that are sold in the little plastic cups or containers at the hardware store home to realize that you have no idea how to care for it. Maybe it's been marveling at the wide array of carnivorous plants at your local botanical gardens, uh, and maybe even getting to see a fly land on one and get eaten. Or maybe it's simply knowing and listening to the music <laughs> about the man-eating plant, Audrey too, in the musical Little Shop of Horrors, one of my favorites. However you've engaged with carnivorous plants, you've likely figured out by now that this is really a whole separate area of plant parenthood and plant passions. Um, these plants require very specific care, very different than most of our tropical plants. And if you don't care for them, they might get you. Or just turn brown and die, like my Venus flytrap did that I tried to care for several years ago, which you'll hear more about later today. Lucky for us, we are joined today by carnivorous plant expert Damon from California Carnivores for an incredibly informative episode on everything we need to know about these mysterious, hungry plants. So, plant friends, welcome to episode 147 of Blue Mangrove Radio. Hello, my sweet plant friends. Welcome back to Bloom and Grow Radio. I hope you've been enjoying the episode so far for season seven. If you have been, please take a minute and leave us a review on your preferred podcast player, ideally iTunes. Um, the reviews are seriously so helpful for growing the show, so thanks in advance. I'm so excited about this episode. Carnivorous Plants has been a highly requested episode for a long time. I personally have had very unsuccessful experiences growing carnivorous plants indoors. I had someone ship me a Venus flytrap a long time ago, many years ago when we were still living in Long Island City. It arrived. I had absolutely no idea how to care for it. It was asking me to use distilled water. It was asking me to plant it in moss instead of soil. I was so confused. I was able to keep the plant alive for like maybe a month or two, and then it totally turned brown and died. So I'm so excited. Damon, our guest from California Carnivores, which is a grower in California. Holy moly, he gives us so much amazing information. So I hope this episode gets you inspired about carnivorous plants. They're really their own little game to themselves, and I'm excited to try to take another stab at them in the future. So without further ado, here's Damon. Damon, welcome to Bloom and Grow Radio. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here today. This has been such a highly requested episode and an episode topic in which I know very little and consider myself self a plant killer of. So very yeah. excited to mine your brain for all of all of your care info. Yeah, well, it's been done many times before, but I'm happy to do it again. We'll see yes. if we can help you keep them alive. Absolutely. So before we dive into all things carnivorous plants and carnivorous plant care, do you want to give the audience a brief introduction to Damon and your incredibly impressive history with carnivorous plant care? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for the uh, incredibly impressive. Yeah. So my name is Damon Collingsworth. I'm the co-owner of California Carnivores and the general manager. I got my first start with carnivorous plants when I was 11 years old. My current business partner, Peter D'Amato, he's like the godfather of carnivorous plants. We joke and call him the bog father because most carnivorous plants grow in bogs. But he hadn't even opened this nursery yet in the summer of 89 when I found him at a local flea market. My dad used to sell like um, various antiques and things at flea markets and I would go with him and then I'd get bored sitting at the booth. And so I would wander around the flea market and look for fun things to buy. You know, this is the 80s. So the leashes were a little bit longer back then. And I found Peter selling just a few carnivorous plants at a table there when I was 11 years old. And I had been like a little zookeeper kid. If you had asked the 10 year old Damon what he wanted to do when he grew up, he would have said zookeeper. Um, I was just so focused on animals and nature. But plants had mostly escaped my attention. I got like a little cactus and my mom used to take me to the, you know, a basic general nursery and I'd pick out little primroses and bring those home. And I had like plant memories, but I wasn't as fixated on those. And that all changed forever when I found Peter there and I bought a Cape Sundew, which is a little sticky plant from South Africa. They have paddle shaped leaves and then the leaves themselves are covered in like hundreds of little glandular hairs. Each hair 
tipped with a drop of special glue called mucilage. So they just like these little octopus plants that like sprinkle, uh, sparkle in the sun. That's why they call them sun dews because the dews, the dew drops on their leaves and how they sparkle in the sun. Oh, and I love that. yeah, and I love them too. Like the same, their same beautiful form that was made to ensnare and lure in insects definitely caught me on that day. And I still even have that same Cape Sundew. I've kept it alive for now. I'm 43, so it's been you know, over 30 years. Oh my God, that's amazing. Those, that those are high stakes around that plant. Oh my gosh, yeah. where do you keep it? Uh, well, I keep it in our 10,000 square foot greenhouse. We have a giant greenhouse here, and I've got a lot of high stake plants here. Lots of things I've had. I've you know, been growing for like 30 years. And then we have lots of things that are um, practically the only one in cultivation. Sometimes they are the only one in cultivation until I spread it around a little bit. So I'm definitely used to high wow. stakes, high stakes horticulture. Oh my gosh. I love that. And I make my whole living this way too, which is the, which is a tricky, tricky thing, tricky sort of magic. Um, but yeah, so that was like the real spark that got me all going. And then Peter opened California carnivores that summer here in Sonoma County, where I'm from. And I just became like the most obsessed little kid. I would uh, go there for birthdays, and Christmas, and just kept collecting. And then when I was around 14, I got my first greenhouse and I started to volunteer here at California carnivores, filling pots. Back then, Peter would pay me um, $10 an hour in plants if I worked here. And so my parents would just drop me off and I would fill pots all day or water or whatever and earn even more plants. It's a pretty sweet deal. That's a pretty sweet deal. I love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, it was a good deal. Um, and we've had other volunteers over the years if it followed like a similar kind of path. But I'm the one that ultimately ended up running it. And I was just basically, you know, active, sheer passion and will. But I've been an owner here since 09 and pretty much running it since then. Peter's pretty much retired the last couple of years. He's retired, but he's still, of course, involved in the nursery and and all that. And today, California carnivores is like the largest, most famous carnivorous plant nursery in the U.S. Peter's book, The Savage Garden, is the award-winning, best-selling manual on growing them. It's used all over the entire world. And we've really created a really wonderful hobby that so many people are really starting to enjoy today. Yeah, it's such an interesting subsect of I guess indoor and outdoor gardening, because depending on where you live, you might be able to keep them outdoors. But it's such an interesting subsect of indoor houseplant care, because I feel like they really do require separate care requirements. Obviously, they do things that our other plants can't. So you one might think, oh, I keep houseplants, I'm going to get a Venus flytrap. But actually, then once you get that said Venus flytrap, you realize how much more learning there is to do. <laughs> yeah, I always tell people that they're probably the most well-known, misunderstood plant in the entire world. Like Just about everybody knows about a Venus flytrap now, thanks to the internet and TikTok and everything else. But most people still don't really know very much about them. And what they think they know about them is usually wrong. <laughs> yeah. So let's dive into that. So let's kind of zoom out. What is a carnivorous plant? What makes, you know, it, it eats something, but what, what makes a carnivorous plant a carnivorous plant? Exactly. And in, bio in biology, there's all kinds of grays and blurry things that come up. And so as horticulturalists, as botanists, we've been forced to come up with like a proper definition to make sure that we're focusing on the group of plants that are all doing this amazing thing, which is catching their fertilizer from prey. It was eating basically, right? So the things that we use to determine that, the first thing that all carnivorous plants have to do is they have to lure. They're really beautiful. I started growing carnivorous plants because I was interested in the weirdness, something that a plant that ate bugs was just such a weird idea to me. And I was a weird little kid and anything that was weird really caught my attention. And so that's what got me into it. But I keep growing them today because they're so beautiful. Most plants, you know, their flowers are designed to attract pollinators, but their leaves are largely made to kind of blend in and avoid being eaten. Whereas carnivorous plants, they have flowers that are often beautiful, but their leaves themselves have evolved to be attractive to catch prey. And because of that, they're very, very beautiful. If you're in the greenhouse in the spring and summer, you see all these bright colors, like bright chartreuse, green, yellow colors, white, red, lots and lots of red. Plants that can stand out amongst the other plants so that those bugs can see them. They often also use a nectar lure. So just like 
flowers. They're trading a little bit of sugar for pollination. They're basically using that same addiction to sugar that they set up to attract these bugs to eat them. So uh, lots of them just have a sugary nectar, including the Venus flytrap. American pitcher plants, um, tropical pitcher plants, they all make a sugary nectar to lure in the insects. The second thing they have to do, of course, is catch them because can't, you know, luring them in is only half the battle. So the catching is there's multiple different kinds of traps. I probably should have said in the beginning, there are a thousand different species, just about a thousand different species of carnivorous plants in the wild. So there's a lot. And it's interesting because, you know, if you grow orchids, you're growing them because they're all related. If you grow cactus, you're growing them because they're all related. And where there would be some differences in care on all those, um, with carnivorous plants, we're growing them because they all have something in common that they do, which means that there are actually 17 different plant families, a thousand different species, and they grow on every continent except for Antarctica. And so we really, there's a lot of different things that we have to do for all these different plants. But I digress and I digress. Anyway, so back to the trapping, because I brought that up because there's a lot of different trapping mechanisms. There's the Venus flytrap that everyone knows. There's also a little aquatic Venus flytrap um, called Aldrovanda that nobody knows. And they have little snap traps that float in the water. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, they're really cool. They're tiny, but they're interesting. And they're also hard to grow and hard to find, but um, cool little subset. But then there's also a lot of um, what we call flypaper traps, like sticky plants. And that's sundews, butterworts, dewy pines, rainbow plants. And uh, I think that's the main ones. A uh, few others that are sticky like that. And obviously things land on the leaves. They get stuck in some sort of a glue and they can get away. There's also lots and lots of pitcher plants, like a pitcher of water. And those, when you talk about gorgeous foliage, that's what came to mind when you were just describing how beautiful the plants can be. Because pitchers, the shape of the of the leaves is absolutely gorgeous. They're crazy. Yeah, they're so beautiful. And there's actually lots of kinds of pitcher plants. So you're probably referencing like the, maybe the tropical pitcher plants with the big cups that hang off the ends of the leaves. Mm -hmm. But then there's also American pitcher plants, which are equally beautiful, native to the U.S. And they have like big trumpets that stick up out of the soil with a little rain lid on top. Um, and they just fill up with yellow jackets and flies. But yeah, they're all so, so beautiful. So the third thing that they have to do to make them carnivorous is digest. And digestion is something that we really associate with animals. But they are, once they've caught that prey, Almost all of them are using um, acids and enzymes, almost always the same ones that animals use to digest their prey into fertilizer. So all carnivorous plants are trapping prey for their fertilizer. Normal plants get their fertilizer from the soil and they get their sugars through photosynthesizing from the sun. Carnivorous plants all photosynthesize from the sun for their sugars, but they uh, get nothing from the soil. Where they grow in the wild, there's almost no fertilizer in the soil for them. And so that's why they've actually evolved to catch fertilizer from their prey. They're not getting sugars or fats or anything out of it that we would. They're getting nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and all their micronutrients. And there's some digestion. They have to actually break down that into accessible forms. And then the last thing that they have to do is there has to be a direct nutrient pathway of absorbing that fertilizer that they've broken down and benefiting the plant. And so once the prey is broken down, there's another set of glands that are usually embedded in the leaves and they're pulling all the fertilizer out of the insect goo, basically, to get all their food. And, you know, people always ask, do they have to eat? Uh, yes, they do. They're not like cats and dogs, or if they don't eat this week or they don't eat this month, they're going to starve to death and die. But they aren't getting anything from the soil. So they do actually need to eat. And that's basically what all of our carnivorous plants are doing. If you have the travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan, friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent, each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the story 
stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. So you bring up soil and fertilizer. So my next question is, where can we find them in real life? Because you mentioned bogs. And I remember in my process of killing my Venus flytrap, that's something I learned that they actually they live in a, in a very different media than most of our, you know, tropical houseplants live in. That's totally true. So like, first off, I always like to start with where the most different kinds of carnivorous plants come from. So we call that like, you know, the center of diversity usually, but I think with carnivorous plants, like what country do you think has the most different kinds of carnivorous plants? Um, I have no idea, but I'm going to guess somewhere in South America. People usually guess like South America or Africa, some very far off exotic tropical place. But it's actually the U.S. The U.S. has the most different kinds of carnivorous plants. Natively. Natively. Yep, absolutely. Um, and people are always really surprised that they do grow in bogs, that they grow, you know, Venus flytraps grow in bogs in North and South Carolina. That's where mm. they're native to. And they've been native there for millions of years. As far as we can tell, they've been, they've been just about only there for a really long time. But in the U.S., we also have American pitcher plants. We have sundews. We have butterworts. In California, we have our own pitcher plant called the cobra plant. Bladderworts. We have the most different kinds of carnivorous plants in the world here, actually. And they are almost always in wetlands, whether it's in the U.S., or abroad, almost always in very wet environments, bogs, swamps, uh, the rainforest, places like that. So in the U.S., all bogs and swamps. You will never find a carnivorous plant uh, anywhere dry. I mean, maybe a few exceptions, but never say never. But for the most part, if you're looking at carnivorous plants in the wild here in the U.S., your feet are probably wet. Mostly they grow in the southeast. Eastern U.S. If you drew a line from eastern Texas to Virginia, everything on the southeast side of that line, basically the south, is capable of having carnivorous plants in their wetlands. Now, we've been really hard on carnivorous plants. We've been really hard on the wetlands. We've been really, as soon as Europeans got here, um, we started putting up roads, dams, drainage ditches, and getting rid of uh, wetland land it wasn't something to protect. It was something to actively get rid of. In the middle 1800s, the U.S. passed the um, Wetlands Reclamation Act, which was all about converting wetlands into usable space. And so we went purposely went and drained all the swamps because we thought mosquitoes, alligators, mud, but when we did that, we got rid of a lot of special things, but we also have almost gotten rid of all the Venus flytraps. Venus flytraps are almost completely extinct in the wild, down to about 30,000 plants, probably somewhere in there. Wow. And there used to be millions. Most of that's all wetland destruction. There's also a poaching pressure that we've relieved over the years. That's one of the reasons why we grow these plants. You know, we keep them here safe as kind of like an arc project. So as they're being destroyed across the world, we try to keep as many here with um, location data, where they came from, professionally grown, just like a botanical garden. But then we also sell all these plants. So I use the collection that I have to make new plants for everybody else. And that allows us to um, bring plants to market at a cheap price. And that relieves uh, poaching pressure because people are less likely to go dig something up out of a swamp if they can just order it online for 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they've been, we've been really um, destroyed and underappreciated over the years. And there's not a whole lot of them left. Other big centers in the world, Australia has a lot of carnivorous plants, mostly sticky sundews. Like they have probably the most different kinds of sundews. South Africa also has a lot of sundews, although the rest of Africa doesn't have very many carnivorous plants at all. And the tropical pitcher plants all come from Southeast Asia, almost all come from Southeast Asia. The Philippines, Indonesia, um, that's where those guys mostly come from. But they're all growing in the wet. Your feet are going to be wet wherever they're growing in the world. Yeah, like I used to live in Borneo where I managed a tropical pitcher plant nursery out there. 
And like uh, in Borneo, well, here in, we get three to four feet of rain every single year. Um, in Borneo, they get like 15 to 20 feet. Wow. Yeah. So we got, it, it's pretty much always raining where they grow. And so that allows the tropical pitcher plants to grow on like rocks and up in trees. So a lot of those are lithophytes or epiphytes, which means grows in trees or grows on rocks. Mm -hmm. But the rain keeps them so wet that they're able to do that. One more thing I'd like to talk about is when carnivorous plants evolved, because that always really surprises people too. So like when I was a kid, we didn't know that much about evolution. I mean, we knew more, more than 100 years ago, but there was lots of things we didn't know, particularly about carnivorous plants. And so we used to think of them as like the iPhone, like the new hot thing of plant evolution, because we're people and we're animal biased. And we had this idea that like, oh, well, if the plants are becoming animals and they must be becoming better and they must be the most advanced. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, we now know that carnivory evolved like 70 million years ago. And most of the carnivorous plants that we have today are actually like relic plants left over from like dinosaur times, basically, which is really cool. So like the so Venus flytraps existed 70 million years ago, which is like right on top of dinosaurs. That's crazy. Isn't yeah, that crazy. I, that's funny. I feel like I talk a lot about how a lot of our tropical house plants look like little aliens, like with their big heart shaped leaves. And now carnivorous plants are like little dinosaurs. They are. Yeah. And they also seem like they're from space too. So <laughs> that's wild. Yeah. yeah. Especially because they could eat you. <laughs> right. 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 I love it. What do you, how do you feel about um, Little Shop of Horrors? Are you pro Little Shop of Horrors or, <laughs> I, or anti? I'm pro. Yeah. It's funny. I was just listening to the, this is so like uh, funny because you would never, I mean, but I just listened to Little Shop of Horrors soundtrack this morning as I got ready for work with my boyfriend. <laughs> Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. I was. No, but I like the movies, of course. You know, I've heard probably like all we we were open to the public for thirty years, and so I've probably heard all the little shop jokes and all the old guys who come in and go, "Oh, you still have all your fingers and stuff like that." And so, you know, over the years, I think they got a little tiresome, but uh, yeah, I still love Little Shop of Horrors. I love that. I had a couple friends that I moved out here from Alabama to start our tissue culture lab about like six years ago. And they had friends that ran the Castro theater here in San Francisco. And so we actually had like our own viewing of the old little shop of horrors uh, at the Castro theater with this all, the whole staff together when they came out here. Oh my gosh. That's so fun. And it was funny because they had the original ending on there. Lots of people don't realize this, but when they made that, you know, the fun musical one, when they made that, that wasn't how way it was supposed to end. Actually, the original ending was everybody got eaten by the plants, including Seymour and Audrey. And then the plants at the end, like destroyed the whole world. And there was like a five minute, super like long scene of like giant plants destroying San Francisco, New York and destroying the whole world. And when they played that for the test audience, everyone hated it. And so they got rid of all that special effects and all the money they spent on that. And they ended it with a happy ending that everybody knows now. Yeah, they needed they needed to uh yeah, they needed I to know. test workshop that. That's just yeah. <laughs> that's hysterical. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Okay, so we've learned about where these plants originate from and the right. fact that they so creepily and so interestingly can digest the flies and wasps right. that they catch. You know, how the heck do we replicate what they need indoors if we as right. houseplant parents want to care for them? So now, is there generalized basic care for most carnivorous plants or does a sundew need very different care than a Venus flytrap needs very different care than a pitcher plant? I would say that there is uh, there is a general set of rules that I'll dive into in the second here, but because they are so diverse, there are all kinds of things that you have to change the rules a little bit for. So it's, uh, it's a big hobby. I've been doing this my entire life, basically, and we're still learning. We're still figuring things out about some of the kind of fine point, harder plants to grow. But for the most part, how do you bring these things out of the swamps and bring them home? Uh, so... We're going to talk all about houseplants because that's the bent of your podcast. However, about 80% of the carnivorous plants that we grow and sell are better outdoors. Who are you selling to, I guess, in the right. States? Right. Well, just about anybody in the U.S. can grow carnivorous plants. American pitcher plants, Venus flytraps, most of the sundews are all fine outdoors in a sunny spot, sitting in a tray of rainwater or distilled water. Rainwater or distilled water is probably the most important rule for all carnivorous plants. Tap water will generally kill them. 
In the swamps where they grow, the water is really, really pure. We think of swamps as dirty places. They're not. They're pristine. And all the minerals that have been in the soil have been washed away by the water for millennia. And so they need very, very pure water. So that's your first real important one. If you've watered it with your tap water and it died after a few months, that might be why. So let's stop and talk about that for a minute, because I remember when I got, I was sent to Venus flytrap which I killed. And I'd love to later, we can kind of, or through the process of this interview, we can use me as an example of what not to do. But I remember when I first got sent a Venus flytrap and learning about the distilled water, I remember still being a little confused about like, there's so many different types of bottled water at the store. So if I had to go to the store and buy water, what am I looking for? Totally. And we get a lot of people that think because of fish tank hobbies that you can just take the water and set it out for overnight and it's going to lose. Right. That it could evaporate the chlorine or whatever. That's not true because it's not the chlorine that are the problem. The chlorine will evaporate and it's no big deal, but it's the dissolved salts that are in the water itself and that won't evaporate out. So that doesn't work. Yeah. Look for the word um, distilled. The water vending machines at grocery stores are also good pure water. So if you've gotten into the hobby pretty heavy, it's good to just bring like a container and fill it up there. It's the cheapest way. Um, And I was just saying, look out for the word purified because that's really been co-opted for babies and they add a lot of um, salts and minerals and vitamins for baby health. And so that's, you don't usually want to use that. Can I use my Brita water? Can I run it through my Brita? Pure and Brita doesn't really do that much as far as taking the dissolved solids out. There's another company called Zero. Zero is the brand and it works just like Brita. Um, I use that at home and that that does do a good enough job. But Pure and Brita, if you know, it'd be better than nothing. It'll take a little bit out, but it generally doesn't take enough out. Um, and rain, rain or melted snow, of course, are totally fine. So you can always collect a little rainwater if that's easy for you. And they'll be outside. So um, if it does rain, that helps you out. And those plants, we always set in two or three inches of that water. So we just take the pot and we put it inside a deep saucer or another container and we put the water in that saucer or container. And then the peat moss that it grows in is like a sponge. And so it's just going to sop up all the water it needs. And that's like a really easy way. We call it the tray method. And it's very easy to keep them wet enough. Because they're from bogs and swamps. If you don't do that, you're probably not going to be able to keep it wet enough. So can you overwater a, a carnivorous plant? Or for the most part, you can leave it in water, in moss and water, and you're okay? Yeah, mostly it's impossible. For those ones, you cannot overwater them. In fact, sometimes with like the American pitcher plants, we'll be like washing them off and we'll set you know some rhizomes into a thing of water. And sometimes they sit there for six months a year just sitting in water and they're usually just fine they're very reluctant to rot because they've been in the swamps for so long so you're essentially what houseplant parents would bottom water a plant set it in a tray of water so the pot can wick up the water and then take it out of that saucer of water you're saying for carnivorous plants keep them in 24 7 saucers of water Yeah. And um, they're actually really hardy, like temperature wise. You're asking like what part of the country could people do that in? Um, Obviously, like here in California, where we are here, our temperatures go up to like maybe 100, a little bit over 100 in the summer times. And then in the winter, even here in California, even coastal Sonoma County, we'll get down to like 20 degrees most winters. And they can even take it colder than that. Most carnivorous plants are, those ones are fine down to like 15. So usually what we tell people, if they're like in a really super cold place, um, like Minnesota, you know, maybe even New York or New Jersey, when it starts to get really, really cold, like below 15 degrees, it's good to put them like into a garage or a window cell. Um, it'd be great if it was like an unheated room because they do need to go dormant. At least temperate ones want to go dormant. I know we were going to talk about house plants, but we're going to hit the general rules of outdoors real quick. So we just bring them into like a, a garage or something like that, and they won't need very much light. So you don't have to worry about that. Just keep them sitting in the water and it can be cold in that garage. Just above 15 Fahrenheit is probably a good idea. So most people can grow carnivorous plants outdoors in the U.S. You just have to put them, put them somewhere if it gets really super cold. And then for the house plants, house plants are different. Like, you've, like you found out, Venus flytraps aren't like the best house plants. It's often what people want to start with. And we can talk a little bit about how to do them indoors if, if you don't have any outdoor space. But the best ones for indoors are probably tropical pitcher plants. 
they're more of like an orchid level of care and they, those you can overwater. So a tropical pitcher plant, because they would grow like in the crotch of a tree in Southeast Asia and it would rain and then dry out a little bit and then rain. Those you want to treat like a regular house plant where it gets a little bit damp uh, and then drying out a little bit in between waterings. And so it takes a little bit of finesse, but kind of just like an easy orchid level of care for most tropical pitcher plant species and hybrids. And then the Cape Sundew, that was my first plant when I was a little boy and we still have it, obviously. So that's a really great, easy starter plant. You're going to want a sunny spot indoors no matter what. Like um, I've got a pothos at home and it just gets a little light from my skylight, which we don't even always open up. And that's just fine for a pothos. And that's fine for a lot of house plants. Carnivorous plants want a lot of sun compar- comparably. So like a west or east facing window, maybe that gets like at least two, but three or four hours of direct sun would be better. So it's going to be a sunny window. So if you don't want to do any artificial light, but a Cape Sundew, it doesn't go dormant. It'll just look beautiful all year round on a very sunny windowsill. They have the added benefit of catching fruit flies, um, which if you have a compost thing by the sink, I do. You probably have fruit flies in the house sometimes. No shame in it. And they also catch fungus gnats. Now, right, everybody... the, the bane <laughs> yeah. of every plant parent's existence. Exactly. Most of you plant parents didn't even know that fungus gnats existed until a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And then you got a house plant. And then all of a sudden, what are all these little black flies? And they're mm-hmm. everywhere. And the sundews and the next plant I'll talk about in a second are really great at catching those little fungus gnats. And I don't know, you know, probably more and more of you are realizing this, but the fungus gnats themselves are annoying, but their little larvae live in the soil and their little larvae eat roots. And so if you're trying to do any like seed growing in the house or even a really big plant, if you're struggling a little bit and you have a lot of fungus gnat larvae in there, it's going to eat all the fine roots right off of there. And so they're great to get rid of. Um, And Cape Sundews are good at that. And then my other favorite house plant are called butterworts. They're not a very well-known plant. I'm really trying to work on that hard to change that. But they are mostly from Mexico. They have little um, kind of fleshy, almost succulent looking leaves. They're like wide sticky leaves in the spring and summer that kind of sparkle. And they also catch small bugs like fruit flies and fungus gnats. And then their flowers are really super beautiful. Most carnivorous plants are grown for the leaves, but um, these ones, mostly people grow them for the flowers. And that's why I like them because I get to like really, um, I cross and make new hybrids all the time to make new butterworts. I make new everything, but the butterworts, I really like making new ones because I get to make new different colored flowers, pinks and reds and oranges, and they come all kinds of colors. And they almost always flower. Like little butterworts, I always tell people they're like African violets and catch your fruit flies. They're kind of delicate. Like a butterwort is a slightly more delicate endeavor just because they don't really have a rhizome or um, they don't have very much to die back onto. But if you're good to them, they can last for years and years too. But those are probably like the three best uh, indoor uh, carnivorous plants. Plant friends, if you are excited about the growing season this year, you have to check out Territorial Seed Company. Territorial Seed Company has an amazing array of seeds and plants that are known for being extremely hardy, vigorous, and productive. In addition to super unique, you can find stuff on their website you cannot find at your local garden centers. I started seeds with them last year and ordered seedlings from them last year and had an amazing experience. They offer such a wide array of plants that you can buy or seedlings, little plants that you can have shipped right to your door and get right into your garden. If you're a small space gardener, I definitely recommend checking out their new kitchen counter collection. I wish they had this collection available when I was growing on my tiny balcony. It's a selection of vegetables specifically bred to produce and grow in small spaces and lower light. For those of us who might want to try growing on windowsills, indoors, under grow lights, or on balconies. And if you're craving some big, beautiful blooms in your outdoor garden this year, maybe try their very moody Odessa Calla Lily, which is new to their line. It is drama. It is the drama um, of a garden. It's dramatic, obsidian-shaped blooms that are purple, almost black, and they are totally breathtaking. They would be such an interesting addition to your garden color palette. Or you can just go ham and order every single one of their amazing, interesting tomato varieties like I did last year. (laughs) Whatever you're growing, Territorial Seed Company has over 40 years experience and you know they have seeds and plants that you can trust. 
I love them and they love you and are offering an exclusive discount for our listeners. So use code GROW10, GROW10 at checkout to get 10% off your first order. So order now at territorialseed.com and use code GROW10 at checkout. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Before we dive more into suggestions, I want to kind of reverse for a minute. So let's talk about growing media because that's another thing that you've that mentioned. Makes it really different. Yeah, it's really different than than houseplant potting mix. So what are we growing these plants in? Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. So yeah, so um, again, because they can't have any fertilizer in their soil, it has to be like this really nutrient poor soil. And um, it's actually usually like peat bogs are growing in in the wild, sphagnum and peat bogs. And so we use sphagnum and peat moss here as our soil medium. So the outdoor carnivorous plants, um, Venus fly traps, sundews, American pitcher plants, that they grow in our basic mix, which is four parts peat moss to one part perlite. And we mix that up ourselves. You can buy it from us on the webpage if you can't find those ingredients locally. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like the kind of carnivorous, carnivorous plant general mix. Now the tropical pitcher plants, we do them in a different one. Cause again, they're usually up in trees. They have like a more open orchid mix. So if you've grown really like, um, special orchids, you've probably encountered New Zealand sphagnum moss. Um, it's probably the most high quality thing you could try to grow a plant in. Sphagnum moss is uh, antimicrobial microbial so it it kind of resists rotting and any other problems that might pop up in your plants so we use uh about 70 percent new zealand long fibered sphagnum mixed in with some chunky ingredients so like equal parts um pumice orchid bark and perlite make up the rest of the mix and we just kind of mix that all together sphagnum has been a little tricky to find lately but because of supply issues but you can usually still find it out in the world and then the things Oh yeah. What's that? Oh, I was just going to about from a sustainability standpoint, do you see your industry moving towards like sphagnum alternatives? We would love to so far. There hasn't, we haven't really been able to find one, honestly. Yeah. There's, um, I have a friend in England who's a soil scientist. who has been working on that and like, there's some things, but honestly, yeah, it's hard to grow carnivorous plants without peat or sphagnum. It really is. Cause that's what they're literally growing in, in the ground. Mm Yeah, it really is, you know, and that that might become more and more of a problem because peat moss, I mean, it's somewhat sustainable, but we harvested it too high of a rate for it to be permanently sustainable. I hope to God it doesn't happen in my lifetime, honestly, but I don't know if, you know, there's some, there's some promise with cocoa peat, which is like a cocoa husk product. And we do use that for some certain things here, but for the long-term growing, it just breaks down too fast. 
Interesting. And are you putting the mosses in like a net pot or are you putting them in like a terracotta pot? Like what kind of pot are you putting the media? Terracotta we avoid because if you've ever grown anything in a terracotta pot, you've probably seen all the white minerals that accumulate on the outside. Those are salts. So terracotta has a soft fire kiln. And so it doesn't lock in all the minerals. And so that starts to like leach out over time. If you had to use terracotta, obviously in the old days, they used to use terracotta before plastic, but you'd have to repot. So we avoid terracotta. Plastic is great. Glazed ceramic is great because that's a hard fire and it won't leach any salts. Um, We also avoid metals. Peat moss eats metal. So uh, no copper, nothing like that. It'll, it'll just eat it like the ocean does. So plastic is generally best for them. The tropical pitcher plants I have used net pots for, but I feel like in the house, it's really not a great tool. You know, it's better to have a little bit more sealed up. So just a nice plastic pot. Got it. So we're growing in moss in a plastic pot. We're watering it by actually not watering it. We're keeping that pot in a jar or saucer of water at all times. So we're constantly replenishing it. So it's at the same level of hydration. And then also, so you mentioned light. So you were saying sunny windowsills are important or like a grow light of sort, like they need, you said four hours, how many hours of direct sunlight? About three or four hours of direct sunlight is good. If you had like a really bright indirect situation, you might be able to do some butterworts and some tropical pitcher plants. But if you want to do like sundews, I always tell people they don't call them sundews for no reason. They like a lot of sun. If you want to do a Venus flytrap indoors, that you would want to be very, very sunny, like a really cooking sunny window. Okay, got it. Yeah, I mean, it's all very, it's very different than houseplant stuff besides the fact that most houseplant parents now have grow lights once we've realized how dark are. Sure. I was just going to say, yeah. So like if you don't have a sunny window, so you'd still like to grow carnivorous plants there, you can still absolutely do that. Grow lights. There's so many different grow lights available now, especially with the cannabis industry. And then now just hobby blowing up in general, there's just so much. I know for sure that like the old um, T5 fluorescent lights, those are great for growing carnivorous plants. If you just want to get the T5 fluorescent light tubes, those are the kind of like thinner tube. That's what the T5 refers to. Not the thick workshop tube. That's like a T8. But then also most of the LED lights that they sell on the market now work just fine. There's um, a Yescom brand that we buy on Amazon. It's like $20 and they're kind of flimsy. They don't last a long time, but they're like a thin tile, like about one foot by one foot tile that you can pretty much stick anywhere. They're like thin, like a sheet of cardboard. And we like those for using those, but most, most of your grow lights will work just fine. We try to keep them relatively close to our plants, probably like six to 14 inches away from the top of the plant. And if you're going to do a grow light, I usually recommend like a 12 to 14 hour photo period. So have a timer on for 12 to 14 hours and off for the rest of the time. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, we are talking to the house plant world where we we have fancy grow lights that look really pretty, and you know the bulbs that you can screw into any. Um, I'm looking at my office that has like my desk lamp that I put a grow bulb in to make it work. So I'm sure our community can figure that out. Okay, so here's a big question. So I sourced my community for questions for you today, and a question that came up that I thought was really interesting is. To fertilize or not to fertilize if your plant is currently eating something. So do you fertilize your carnivorous plants or do you just let them catch what they catch, especially if we're dealing with indoors where they're not going to see as many flies and wasps as they would outdoors? Sure. Yeah. And we have the same problem here at the nursery because I've got like 10,000 square foot, you know, nursery. It's all full up of plants. All right. And so not that many bugs get into the greenhouse in general. And then the competition is just so high that, you know, most of these fly traps in the nursery are probably catching that much, but you can supplement that with fertilizer. So I'll start with Venus fly traps. Venus fly traps actually prefer to eat real food. Um, we have a, a maxi fertilizer, M-A-X-S-E-A that we've recommended here for years, um, as a foliar fertilizer. And we do that at about a quarter teaspoon per gallon. And then you can just mist the leaves of any carnivorous plant with that about once a month. And you can do that with a Venus flytrap and it will help it. But eating for a Venus flytrap, live prey is absolutely the best way to feed them fertilizer. So we do that with mealworms. You can buy a mealworm at the pet shop. 
And then just, um, you know, put it inside the trap. It'll snap closed and digest that for about 10 days. But one mealworm, it'll be noticeable how much your plant grows a week or two after if you feed it a mealworm. Really? So you're going to actually hand feed your Venus flytrap if it doesn't catch anything. And how that would be best. frequently would you feed it? I mean, you could do all the traps, but like if you just did one trap every week or two, that's plenty, honestly. Okay. And then every week or two. Yeah. And mealworms can stay in the fridge for like a month or two alive. And it does need to be live prey. Venus flytraps need the constant stimulus of that thing that they caught inside the trap to, to digest. And so usually dead mealworms don't work. Um, so try oh to get gosh. something alive. I know. I know. Definitely but didn't do that with my Venus flytrap. It helps. Um, and fertilizer is tricky because if you had asked us like 30 years ago, do you fertilize carnivorous plants? Every carnivorous plant grower worth their salt would say, no, that kills them. So um, you do want to stick to the fertilizers I recommend at the amounts that I recommend. You can find all this information again on our webpage and on our book. We sell the Maxi Fertilizer, but make sure that you're very careful, very careful. So what about, you were saying for indoor plant parents, tropical pitcher plants were a good one, a Cape Sundew. So the Cape Sundew, which has a sticky leaf that a fly is just going to land on, how does it then digest it? Does it digest, it doesn't have to catch it, like capture it, like it'll just break the fly down on its leaf? It's of course always a little trickier to talk about these things without pictures in front of us, mm-hmm. but um, all the little tentacles are semi-mobile on most sundews. And so- if a fly lands in the center of the sundew leaf, all of the tentacles are going to slowly move towards like fingers moving towards the palm of your hand to push them down into the center of the leaf and hold them fast there. And then certain sundews, like the cape sundew is one of these, is what we call an active sundew. So the whole leaf can slowly wrap around and hang on to it like a little octopus tangle, uh, tentacle. Wow, that must yeah. be wild to watch. It's cool. Yeah, it only takes about 10 or 15 minutes, actually. And then you can use fertilizer instead of the insects on sundews. So on that one, you can use the maxi fertilizer and just mist the leaves. And you'll see the leaves curl up as if they've caught something and all the tentacles move to the center. And then after a few hours, they'll unfurl again. And once something is caught on the sundew leaf, whether it's actual fertilizer or an insect, the little glands at the ends of the hairs that make glue, once they've caught something, they stop making glue and another set of glands starts making acid and they put that right on the insect's body and it starts to liquefy the, the soft parts of the bug. The exoskeleton of a bug is very hard to digest and so that's al- almost always remains. But the inside parts will turn to this kind of gross bug goo and that will drip onto the leaf and the leaf sucks up all the fertilizer it needs with another set of glands. Wow. Okay. So you can just mist your sundew at home with fertilizer. That's it. Yeah. That sounds like the easiest, probably also nicest thing to see. Cause I feel like that probably wouldn't be very aesthetically pleasing to have like on your windowsill. <laughs> it's true. I know. I mean, they look a little, they can look a little gross when they have a lot of bugs on them. Honestly, in the greenhouse, they don't catch that many bugs. Like I said, and it's funny. Like sometimes I almost forget that they catch bugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I probably disappoint a lot of the listeners, but I almost like the sundews better when they're inside and they're not covered in insects. So the fertilizer is a, is a nice trade-off. They get everything they need and not so many gross bugs. And then the tropical pitcher plants, we fertilize those in an even different way. So since they have those cups right on the ends, those are just like little stomachs, modified leaves. They're like a little pitcher that hangs off the end of the leaf and they fill up with acid and enzymes. So like all that fluid inside a pitcher plant is put there by the plant. So before it even pops open, it'll be halfway full of all those enzymes, very complicated stuff in there. So it could be a bug. If you want to put a mealworm or a cricket or anything like that, and they could be dried bugs, they don't have to be alive for the other plants, um, you could do that. But an easier thing to do is the Osmocote slow release fertilizer pellets. Now, if you have house plants, you may have found this thing already. I love it for all my plants. I just throw some on top of the soil of your pot. And every time you water, it gives a little fertilizer to your you know, regular house plants. Now with carnivorous plants, we actually have a little stomach on the end to put that into. So we take one of those fertilizer pellets and we just put it into one into each pitcher about once a month. And that's like a thousand bugs. So it'll just digest all the fertilizer out of that little pellet as opposed to a bunch of those bugs. Also a little bit easier to deal with. 
Yeah, that's clever. I I would take a pellet over a dead bug any day. Sure. You know, and that's one of the things like the hobby started off like very um, for a plant hobby, particularly very strangely kind of male centric. Like in the, when I was a kid, it was mostly just a bunch of kind of like, you know, old guys growing these plants, which, you know, that's cool. But honestly, like it's mostly ladies that like plants for the most part. I mean, not to like stereotype anybody, but mostly, you know, it's, it's ladies that like flowers. And so we've really tried to like, we love the cool thing that they eat bugs, but what we really try to show everyone is just how beautiful they are. And there's great ways to grow these beautiful plants and appreciate them in your house without having a bunch of crickets in your fridge or anything gross like that. Yes, I will say we have about probably 85% female audience with Boom and Grow, but I do want to give a shout out to my 15% males, non-binary, everyone, you know, plants are for everyone, Absolutely. Um, you know, so shout out to to all of our different genders and identities that we have listening, listening. Of course, of course. We're all inclusive here too. Yes, absolutely. So I want to hit you up with a couple of listener questions. I can't believe how quickly this hour is flying by. It goes by fast. So we have a few garden party members who have some questions. So, well, number one, a few people asked about humidity indoors. Do they need a lot of humidity? Should we be growing them in terrariums? How should we be managing humidity here? I would say for most carnivorous plants, light is the more important thing, but mostly they do appreciate high humidity. So, you know, you can either do that in a nice terrarium. It's good to have it not be entirely closed up. A little bit of airflow is nice. Maybe like a half lid or something like that to keep the humidity in. Anything nice like a bell jar, you know, anything like that. Some of the sundews do really well all sealed up inside like a nice glass, you know, in those glass little terrariums with like a top on it. That's a great way of keeping humidity. There's also humidity trays. So you may have found that you can put like a little tray underneath your plant with some gravel in that. It's a nice decorative rocks and you just wet the gravel and throughout the day, it'll humidify the plant above it. But mostly if, as long as it's picturing, like a tropical pitcher plant, if it's picturing, it's happy and you probably don't need to worry about the humidity that much. Lots of people just grow them on a sunny window still hanging there with nothing around them. Okay. Interesting. In a normal dry, you know, 40% humidity. Okay, cool. Yeah. They'll adjust to that. Most of them will adjust to that. Okay. Got it. Mark wants to know, he likes Nepenthes because he doesn't have to do dormancy, but he's still curious about dormancy tips for Venus fly traps for growing indoors. Sure. Yeah. So if you've been growing it inside and you absolutely have no outdoor place to put it and it's getting towards Halloween, it's time for it to go dormant. What do we do? We have this crazy thing called the fridge method. So believe it or not, if you don't have the ability to make that Venus flytrap go dormant on its own right, what you can do is you can take it out of the pot and wash all the soil off. And we have videos on our YouTube channel exactly how to do this. You'll see a little white pseudo bulb. So Venus flytraps have like a little white bulb underneath there. And you're just going to put that in a Ziploc bag with a little bit of lightly damp sphagnum moss. And you just put that in the fridge from around Halloween to maybe Valentine's Day. If you're going to put it back outside, you want to make sure that the night temperatures are above freezing because although they can take the cold, once they start to grow in the spring, if they catch a frost on those new leaves, it will set them back a little bit. So if you're going to put it back outside, leave it in the fridge until it's a little bit warmer. But if it's just going to go into grow lights, Halloween to February is plenty enough time for it to be in the fridge, pot it right back up and put it back under lights and it'll start to grow. And that's enough to give it a dormancy if you don't have any other way of doing that. Got it. Okay, cool. Another listener asked, I'm wondering if I should fertilize my Nepenthes alata. If yes, how? It does catch an occasional fly. Yeah, so we kind of hit that, but I will use this as an opportunity is like, if if it is catching bugs, you can still put the Osmocote pellet in there. They won't, okay. It's not an either or thing. Cool, but use that uh, Osmocote pellet technique. I like that better. and can put one into each pitcher every single pitcher can take one and you'll be amazed at how much bigger how much more colorful the next pitchers are Mm -hmm. oh i love that it makes a big difference that's so fun to do that and experiment and watch it's really fun yeah and then one more barbara says can you overwater which we kind of talked about can you overwater sundews and butterworts i bottom water with distilled water but they seem to be constantly requiring a top up they are potted in a moss bark mix and in my grow tent where humidity ranges 50 to 60 percent yeah so i read that question i was thinking you know the mix is a little bit off so that may be part of the reason why the water is going through so fast like 
I'd be curious to know which moss she used. Sometimes people accidentally get into that um, Oregon green moss that people use decoratively, you know, to line baskets. You'll see that in nurseries. Don't ever use that Oregon green moss. It's sometimes even sold as sphagnum moss. Avoid that. So sometimes like the mix could be a little bit of the problem. That might be why it's drying out a little bit faster. And then as far as like overwatering goes, you know, sundews, it's impossible to overwater, but um, the butterworts are a little bit different. And I'd like to take this opportunity just to talk about that really quickly. So the Mexican butterworts do make great houseplants, but they are from Mexico and they grow like often next to like um, succulents and agaves. And even though they look very delicate in Mexico where they grow, they have very dry winters where they get almost no water. And so many little butterworts will make what we call a succulent rosette. So they'll change from being have like, like wide, stretched out, sticky leaves for catching bugs. And then they'll make this thing, this little rosette of tight little jelly beans that looks like a little hen and chick. And at that point, you want to take your butterwort out of the water and just sprinkle it maybe once every like couple of weeks, keeping it lightly damp, but not sopping wet until it starts to make those sticky leaves again. Now, some suck because again, butterworts grow all over Mexico. Some species like a marginata and gigantea will not require that and can be kept in the water all the time. Whereas other ones like um, some mornensis, gypsicola, they'll make a very tight rosette and those ones want to be a little bit drier. I always tell people with plants, it's a good idea to follow their lead. You don't need to do anything. So you don't need to dry it out to make it make that succulent phase. It's going to tell what time of year it is by the day length. It's going to see that the day is getting shorter and it'll do that all on its own. So just follow its lead when it makes the succulent rosette, dry it out. And when it's sticky again, get it wet again. It's not so much about the timing. It's more about how the plant's doing. Okay. So in terms of your best recommended plants, if I'm a beginner and I want to try, you know, a carnivorous plant for the first time, it sounds like you're recommending tropical pitcher plants, cape sundews, or butterworts. Do you have any recommendations for maybe people who have tried a carnivorous plant before that like might be like a 2.0 recommendation? Sure. Yeah. Well, that's the thing about it. It's such a big hobby and you can start off with a nice, easy plant like that Nepenthes aleta that one of your um, listeners questioned about. That's a really easy, basic plant, but there are actually like 170 different species of tropical pitcher plants alone. And I mean, Nepenthes aleta is a beautiful little plant with like six inch red waxy pitchers that are kind of narrow, but some tropical pitcher plants can grow pitchers that will be like hold three liters of digestive fluid and be like two feet tall. Wow. There's, there's also ones that grow on top of very tropical mountains, ultra highland areas like Nepenthes Loi and Edwardsiana, which are very um, hard to grow and rare in collections. So, I mean, we have those here and I've been growing them for like 20 years to get them to look the way I want them to look, you know. Um, so we have everything. You can start with the Cape Sundew, but you could also start with a really hard Nepenthes that almost nobody is growing and help figure it out. So, you know, we're, we're actually figuring out how to grow a lot of these new species here. So once you're really deep in the hobby, there's plenty of room for you to To keep playing around yeah try a harder plant to grow just like orchids you can start with a phalaenopsis but then geez there's mastivellias there's draculas there's everything it's the same here i love that and i just wanted to ask one more follow-up question about venus fly traps to me after talking with you i feel like a venus fly trap is to the carnivorous plant world what a succulent is to the plant world where everyone thinks oh they're so easy to care for and then they kill them and then they right. think that they can't keep them alive i feel like that's a very similar venus fly trap thing it's like it the is. entry plant that like get discourages a lot of people you mentioned that venus fly traps are not sustainably sourced anymore. Do you recommend not buying them? Cause I feel like you see them everywhere. Like you see them at the grocery store, like in the little plastic, you know, like at home Depot in the little plastic right, containers, right. like, is it okay to be buying them? It is okay to buy those actually. I think you might have misunderstood a little bit. They are endangered in the wild and there was poaching pressure before. Mostly now all the Venus fly traps that you see are being mass produced in tissue culture. Um, all those ones that you see at the harbor shops are all being mass produced usually like in the Netherlands or India. So they're totally um, fine to buy. They're usually not set up for great success. So if you find one at the harbor store, you often find it in too small of a pot. It's got that dome on top. You're gonna take it out of there right away. They're not really great intro plants because they usually have bad information on them. And we've really had to fight that as we built the hobby. You know, people would always come in and say, oh, these are hard to grow. Well, Venus flytraps, you know, if you do what I say, 
I've had all the same Venus flytraps since I was 12 also. They're here in the nursery. You just have to grow them outside. If you grow them outside, which is actually a little bit easier, and it's a good excuse to go outside. If you have some outdoor space, to go look at them. Lots of people want to keep them indoors because they're so charismatic. You know, Venus flytraps aren't too hard to grow as long as follow what we say. Yeah, so Daniela, who runs the nursery with me, she's one of my best friends. She just did a really popular TikTok um, all about how you can ser- save a Venus flytrap from one of those big box stores. Oh, I love it. Okay, well, I'm on TikTok, so I'll have to go follow you and binge your content. I haven't followed you. I haven't watched your TikTok content, only your Instagram. Oh, yeah, well, it's fun. Yeah, so I'll have to go check it out. All right, cool. Well, thanks for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Of course. Man, you're such a good educator. This has been yeah. so like chock full of information. Thank you. Yeah, well, I've been talking about carnivorous plants and plants particularly for practically my entire life. So. Yeah, it's amazing <laughs> that this was your 11-year-old passion that you've now, your co-owner mentored you and now you own the shop that you, you know, was a patron of when you were 11. It's an amazing story. Thank you. Yeah, it's just like every day is basically the 11-year-old me's dream come true around here. And I've basically hired all my friends over the years. And so, you know, it's a, I'm really, really proud of the business that I've created um, and all the joy that it's brought to people in the world and all the, everything it's done for the plants themselves. I'm just really, really proud of what I've done. That's so cool. So if people are interested in ordering some carnivorous plants now after this episode, where can they find you? And it also sounds like you have a lot of educational resources for people to continue their journeys. So where can we find you, buy from you and learn from you? Yeah, thanks for that. So you can always go to californiacarnivores.com to order all of your plants. Um, We ship in the pots, which is different from most competitors. So you'll have almost no transport shock that way. And now is actually a great time to order your your temperate plants anyways, because they're dormant and they'll come up in the spring in your area with almost no uh, transport shock. But yeah, we ship in pots and we guarantee live delivery and we ship every single day, hundreds of orders. So um, it usually goes out pretty fast and we do, we're really good at it. And if you had a problem, we'd take care of you right away. As far as more information goes, we're of course on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and YouTube. We do a lot of videos on YouTube. I'm working on a seed sowing series right now. So if you guys want to go really deep and try to grow them from seed, I'm working on that. Um, And of course, our book, The Savage Garden, I can't recommend it enough. If you want to grow carnivorous plants, you should buy that book first. It's on Amazon and we sell autographed copies here at the nursery, but people love it. If you think I'm informative, the book is even way better. Such an amazing name too. (laughs) The Savage Garden, such a brilliant name. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. So California card numbers across all your socials. So thank you so much, Damon. This was so fun. Who knows? Maybe I'll try my hand at a different, maybe I'll try my hand at a sundew or a pitcher um, after this conversation. Well, we'll send you some after this is all done. I'll get your address and we'll send you something to try. Oh, okay. I'll have to keep, I'll have to keep everyone posted on Instagram. Yeah. (laughs) Fun. All right. Well, thanks so much. Well, thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate you thanking me and giving me the time to um, share my joy about these wonderful plants. My pleasure. Thank you so much to Damon. Definitely follow him. uh, Follow California Carnivores. They make really fun content. And man, I'm really inspired by this episode. I, I don't think I understood just how wide the array of carnivorous plants are. They're so beautiful and so cool, and Damon has such an obvious passion for them. It really made me passionate, too. One quick disclaimer I did want to say, we did talk about peat moss in this episode. I understand it's a very hot topic in the gardening industry. Listen, do what you want with all of this information. We reference it in this episode because it is the main growing media currently for carnivorous plants. Damon did offer alternatives. You do you when it comes to choosing what you want to grow in. It's my responsibility with this podcast to interview the experts and and get you the information and then you choose what you want to do with it. But man, I was really blown away at how knowledgeable Damon was. He's such a good educator. If you liked this episode, if there are deeper dives of carnivorous plants that you would want to know um, or explore with Damon, let me know. Maybe I could convince him to come back for a part two. Okay, plant friends, it's February, the month of love. I hope you've been showing your plants some love as we truck through the winter. It's snowing as I record this episode, and I'm all cozy inside in our warm house with my tropical plants looking at, you know, 12 inches of snow outside. (laughs) I hope you've been enjoying the winter. I hope you've been honoring the quieter winter season in yourselves 
whatever that might look like and whatever that means for you. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show on your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, if you wouldn't mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review, that would be tremendous. Reviews are so helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thank you so much in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Bloom and Grow content, we have so many fun options for you that I want to tell you about. First off, there is the free Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test. It's free, it's super fun, and it only takes three minutes to complete. You take the test and you get your plant parent personality profile. And with that, you get a list of your strengths and weaknesses as a plant parent. And most importantly, my curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are perfectly suited for you and your planty interests based on your results. The test lives at bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality and can always be found in the show notes of this episode. Okay, plant friends, here's the really good stuff. If you are looking to really grow and up-level your plant parent skills this year, I cordially and proudly invite you to join the Bloom and Grow Virtual Garden Society, rooted in high-quality education and plant community. Plant friends, this is not your grandma's garden society. It's virtual and therefore connects you with plant friends around the world, accessed via our proprietary garden party platform and app, and has the best educational and community-based content and resources available to anyone. When you join, you get immediate access to the entire Bloom and Grow Garden Party platform and app, which is our exclusive space off social media, algorithm free, troll free, with tons of amazing ways to meet other plant parents like you, like regional groups, daily conversation prompts, and even a plant swap space, which is pretty cool. And in addition to that, you get all of the exclusive premium society content, which is three monthly live calls with myself and our horticulturist in residence and beloved Bloom and Grow radio guest, Leslie Halleck all in the interest of helping you grow. Leslie hosts monthly Node of Knowledge plant science lectures and monthly office hours, which we call AHAs or Ask Our Horticulturist Anythings, where you can troubleshoot your personal plant collection problems with her. Think about that. You have access to a horticulturist to troubleshoot your personal plant care issues. So amazing. And then I host monthly Growing Joy calls for community development and to explore the plant care, self-care aspect of plant parenthood. Plus, when you join, you not only get access to the upcoming live calls, but you get full access to all of the replays of previous calls and lectures, like the Science of Plant Dormancy or Grow Lights 101 and beyond. So you can binge your way to your best year yet of plant parenthood. Please come join us. We're having so much fun. Learn more by clicking the link in the show notes or visiting jointhegardensociety.com. For anything else, plant friend, I'm here for you. Feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, follow me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and behind the scenes podcast content. Thank you again for listening to Bloom and Grow Radio. It is my true honor and delight to always help you keep blooming and keep growing. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. 
There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will Will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click Click the community plan. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 